good morning and welcome. On um, actually, there might be a bit of rain, but there's some lovely sunshine out there too. Um, a very warm welcome to Zion this morning, and of course a warm welcome to those of you who are out there on YouTube right now, or maybe a little later in the day or later in the week. We trust that our time together will be a truly blessed time with our Lord. And we have Helen with some notices, I think, please. Well, good morning, everyone. And can I add my welcome to, to Jane's welcome to our worship this morning? If there are any visitors with us, please join us for refreshments in the beacon after the service. Prayer ministry will be available at the end of the service with Peggy and Jean, if you would like someone to pray with you. Um, there is no junior church or creche this morning, but if parents would like to take their children into the beacon later on, there are some um, activity things there that you can use, but um, they're not supervised activities. Parents will need to be with your children. A reminder that we have a, a communion service at six o'clock today. We're on to summertime now, so we've got a, a, a communion service at 6 p.m. led by Nick Cruff. And everyone is very welcome. On Saturday, we've got Jazz in the Beacon, Saturday the 13th of April. Um, if, but Mel would like some cakes, please. So if anyone can make a cake for Saturday, please let Mel Evely know. Um, or come along on Saturday and bring a cake with you. The elders' elections, um, nominations close at the end of this week. So if anyone is feeling called to be nominated as an elder, Please get your nomination into the office by the end of this week. Thank you. And family news, just continue to pray for people that are known to you who are ill or waiting test results and consultations and things. Um, we've had no notification of anyone who wants to be me mentioned publicly in, in, um, in worship. So, um, <coughs> but please continue to pray for people that you know. Thank you. I'll hand over to Jane now and Chris who are leading us this morning. Thank you, Helen. Our theme today is God's generosity um, to us, especially thinking about his generous gift in creation and our responsibility to care for it. Those of you in fellowship groups may be aware that this week we are starting a new study um, all around God's generosity, gift, and grace. Our God is a generous God. His grace is revealed fully in Jesus Christ, and his gift is shown to us in his Holy Spirit. All these aspects we'll be exploring in groups and in worship in the coming weeks. Hence, our worship this morning gives us an opportunity to start focusing on this by thinking about God's creation and how his gift to us also gives us responsibilities. And so as we celebrate God's generosity to us, we sing together, you're the author of creation.
now we take a few moments to pray. So let us pray together our thanks and our confessions to God. Heavenly Father, as we have just sung, you are indeed the author of creation, and your cry of love rings out across the lands. Father God, we come together this morning giving thanks to you for your wonderful creation. We thank you for the beauty that surrounds us in nature as we see all the encouraging signs of spring around us. We thank you for the love and care we experience from friends and family. We thank you that you and your world provide for us so generously. Heavenly Father, as we give thanks, we bring to you our confession that so often we are not acting as you would wish. We are sorry that we have lost our sense of wonder at the world, that we have been selfish in our use of the resources it provides. Forgive us for living for today and not thinking about the needs of future generations. Forgive us for always wanting more while others go hungry. As we meet today, give us, we pray, a new sense of the splendour of creation, a new commitment to cherish, nurture and protect the world, and a renewed desire to share our blessings. We ask our prayers in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory. For ever. Amen. Thinking about um, the theme today led um, Chris and I to invite a couple of young people from our church family to write a quiz for us. And so we are about to share a quiz um, and we give all the credit to um, Toby and Leo Colchin. Um, their um, questions are quite interesting, not ones that I could have thought up. Um, and um, Toby did a brilliant PowerPoint, so we're trusting now that the technology is going to be with us and we'll be able to share this PowerPoint. Um, and Leo is going to come and be your question master. So we have eight questions. Leo is just getting himself wired up for sound. And uh, um, what we're going to do is Leo is going to ask you the questions now. We've been a bit soft on you, really, because we've given you multiple choice. So there's three choices for each question. What we suggest is that Leo will read the question and the choices that you've got, and then I'll ask you to show your hand if you dare, if you think you know whether it's A, B, or C. So let's give it a go, Leo, and see how we get on. So where's number one, please, Ian? What is the biggest island in the world? A, Antarctica, B, Australia, or C, Greenland? Okay. Those who think A, please show a hand. Mm, this is going to be uh, interesting then. B, okay. C, oh, 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 some of you are looking very enthusiastic that you know it's C. That might be because you had inside knowledge, of course. Um, Bill. Uh, so actually, yeah, it's C, Greenland, isn't it? Which was a total surprise to me and mine. So 
well done Leo and Toby for um, extending our knowledge. And actually, even more interesting is it's a vast island on which the world really seriously depends. And of course, um, the changes in climate are meaning that it is actually melting a little faster than it would have ordinarily, which could have massive results. But we'll, we'll leave it there. So, number two. What is the radius of the world? A, 6,371 kilometers, B, 7,839 kilometers, or C, 5,982 kilometers. Okay, so those that are going with A, where are your hands? Those of you going with B? Okay, anybody going with C? Yeah, you see, they're, they're very evenly spread. You've given them good questions because they're a real mix of opinion here. So it's actually a 6,371 kilometers, which for those of us who might need to know, is sort of around about 4,000 miles. So that means that the world is huge, doesn't it? Absolutely huge. Uh, okay, Leo, question three. How many species of bees are there in the world? <laughs> A, 19,500, B, 20,000, or C, 21,000. Okay, A's, show your hands, please. B's, show your hands, please. B's. C's, show your hands, please. Oh, no, we've got them there. You see, it's B's, so it had to be B. <laughs> And isn't that cute? I couldn't have done that. That's wonderful. Okay, carry on. It. Um, next one, Ian, that's it. What's the, what's the world record for the heaviest pumpkin? 1,247 kilograms. B, 9,800... No, 985 kilograms. Or 1,687 kilograms. Okay, A's, show your hands, please. B's. C's. Oh, we got them, didn't we? Because it's A. A. All I, I mean, when the boys came up with that, all I could think of to say was, that's a lot of pumpkin soup. <laughs> My goodness, I don't know quite what it would taste like. Um, okay, Leo, number five, please. What percentage of the world's coral reefs were lost between 2009 and 2018? A, 8%, B, 14%, or C, 19%? Okay, A's. Thank you. B's. Thank you. And C's. Thank you. Well, actually, guys, if, it, if there could be an encouraging answer, it's actually 14% rather than the higher one that you mostly went for. Um, and that slide, if you have the chance to read it, is incredibly interesting about the ways that we can protect, even in our little way. We may not have a coral reef in Frampton Cottrell, but we can certainly take actions in our own lives to further protect them. Okay. In what year will there be more plastic in the ocean than fish? Is it A, 2080, B, 2060, or C, 2050? A's? Anybody think it's 2080? B's? Anybody think it's 2060? Uh, C's? Anybody think it's 2050? Actually, it's C, 2050. Um, Big concerns, I think, for our oceans. Number seven, Leo. How many species face extinction today? Is it A, 500,000, B, 1 million, or C, 750,000? Okay, A's. B's. And C's, please. Okay, well, sad to say, it actually is B. 
uh, 1 million, which is just uh, mind-blowing, really. Um, and of course, as we see on the slide that Toby put together, um, the threat to wildlife from our <coughs> mankind's, <coughs> humankind's uh, abuse of the world is indeed massive. And so, the last question, please, Leo. When is Earth Day? Is it A, 22nd of April, B, the 5th of September, or C, the 12th of January? Okay, who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? And who thinks it's C? Well, guys, actually it's A, the 22nd of April, which actually makes this worship very timely, doesn't it? Um, so what we have been talking about is that actually the 22nd of April then, maybe some of us could have a real resolve. I've marked it in my diary. Um, Earth Day has been in existence since 1970, which I certainly didn't know, some of you may. Um, I've marked it in my diary, and I reckon that even if I pray, even if I think about the plastics that perhaps in haste I didn't recycle in the way that I could have done, if it makes us take any small actions, I think those of you that have been at various events that we've had in the past, we've often picked up on tiny actions can still, put together, make a big difference. So 22nd of April, a date for your diaries, please. That's great. Uh, okay, so those eight questions, I think you'll agree, were a little bit surprising, a little bit different, but they've made us think about um, God's creation, the world, and how we better look after it. I've got to ask you, please, do give the Colchin, actually it's the family, because Kate helped as well, so do give the Colchin family a round of applause, please. Um, okay, I forgot to get the tin of birthday chocolates out, so if somebody's near the door, Jean, could you please run and get the birthday chocolates in, from the office, you'll need a key. Ian is just going to supply you with a key. Sorry, schoolboy error. I actually went on Friday to make sure that there's plenty in there and it's absolutely packed. And then I went and left it in the office. So, let's hope now, now I've sent Jean, that there actually are some April birthdays. Uh, so, do we have any April birthdays, please? We, um, we give thanks for the birthdays that have gone and we look forward to the birthdays that are to come. And we will sing the birthday song if, if Ian can find it okay. Yep, lovely.
Beautifully sung. Thank you. Well done. Um, we're about to share in singing a hymn together. Um, during that time, um, if there are any children, and I'm only spotting you guys at the front, but um, there are no facilities today for Junior Church, but there's plenty out in the beacon for them to do, to play with, if you'd like to go out there at any point during the rest of the worship, you feel free. I suppose anybody could go out really and play games, <laughs> but I might get into trouble with Chris for encouraging that, so <laughs> perhaps not. Okay, let's share together as we sing um, all creatures of our God and King. The reading set for this week in um, this five-week course is Psalm 8, which encourages us to reflect on the blessings of creation. And so I'd like to suggest that we now read Psalm 8 together. Um, I will read the first verse, and then if we alternately read it, that will be brilliant. So I'll take the white, and if you'd like to take the yellow. Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have your glory in the 
Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And as we think about those words, we sing, O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name. you'll all be doing in the house group. But actually, while we were thinking about creation, I thought Peter was bringing me a bunch of flowers, for goodness sake. 
But actually, he's an advert. He's got lots of flowers. And so we thought it was quite a nice moment in worship to just for him to say. Yeah, so I am bringing you flowers. Uh, how do we become generous? We become generous by being generous. Uh, we have so many flowers and plants. Uh, we'd love you to take, uh, take some away with you this morning and uh, find a neighbor, a friend, and just <coughs> give them some flowers and say, with love from Zion. There you are. And then just outside, just help yourself. There's potted plants, there's bouquets of flowers. Who can I give flowers to? Oh, beautiful lady. That's brilliant. Thank you, Peter. And what um, a very appropriate way to celebrate creation um, with our friends, with whoever we happen to think would appreciate a bunch of flowers today. And so really good that we now go on to um, an excerpt from the video that you'll all be using if you're in fellowship groups. Um, and they will be used too in this week and the next four weeks of worship to encourage you to think about this theme of, in today's case, God's generosity. And so if we could play that video now, please, that would be great. On this building site, we see bricklayers, builders, joiners, electricians, plumbers, painters and decorators, all hard at work creating new homes for people. In the story of creation found in Genesis, we already see the nature of God as full of abundance and generosity. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land. God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. Let birds fly over the earth, across the vault of the sky. God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over the livestock and all the wild animals. Then God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. In those words of Genesis that we've just heard, God reveals himself as a generous creator. If the work of creation reveals God's generosity, then how much more is his generosity shown in the work of recreation, in the redemptive work undertaken through Jesus Christ. There we see generosity, gift and grace expressed in an extraordinary way. Possibly the most well-known Bible verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In God's rescue plan for all of humanity, his salvation plan, God gives his only son in order that all of humanity may be rescued from evil, from sin and from death. On the cross, we see Jesus' amazing act of self-giving love, offering up himself for all of humanity. It is an amazing act of extraordinary generosity. And it is through the cross that Jesus makes it possible 
for us to be restored into a loving relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. Another way that God shows his generosity to us is through the gift of the Holy Spirit received at Pentecost. As scripture tells us, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has given us. The very heart of God is Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And in those relationships of love, we see the generosity of God lived out. So in response to the amazing and abundant generosity of God, Christians seek to respond to God through their acts of kindness, service and giving. But more on that later. And now we welcome Chris to share his word to us. Jane. Morning, everyone. Um, you wouldn't believe what a difference it makes to have someone like Jane who leads the first part of the service. She's done by, by far done the lion's share of everything. Um, so, generous God. And we're going to look this morning at how that is evident in, in the creation all around us. I guess we're all quite used to re referring to the creation as God's handiwork. But Franciscans have an interesting way of looking at it. They call it the first Bible. Because we look at creation and we learn about God. Remember last Sunday, Easter Sunday, Sharon had symbols of, of new life up on the screen there. I guess we're lucky in the Northern Hemisphere that, that Easter for us falls in the spring, so that all around us there are those symbols of new life. I was away for a few days this past week, I came back and a, an azalea had burst into flower in, in my front garden in the time that I was away. New life springing up all around. And I just I saw something the other day too about the way the caterpillar crawls into the chrysalis and hangs there. And then, miraculously, really, bursts out in the beautiful shape of a butterfly. What an amazing example of, of transformation and what a symbol of, of resurrection. So much when we look at creation to learn about the nature of God. And we get to think this morning particularly about, about the generosity of God. Ever since I was quite a young fella, I've liked gardening because it always amazed me that, you know, have a, a few packets of seeds, which back when I was a lad, you could buy for a few pence. It's different these days, but a few packets of seeds can fill a salad bowl, keep you in vegetables for, for weeks on end. It's just amazing that, that, that generosity that is there all around us, all the time. We are very privileged to live amid such abundance. But of course, with privilege comes responsibility. So let's, for a few minutes, think about some of our responsibilities. Did you know that there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis? We heard the first one read during that video clip. But the second one in chapter two, that's because the Old Testament is made up of lots of strands of literature that over time got woven together. And when you read Genesis now, chapter two almost seems like a, reads like a summary of the first story, but it's got a bit more detail uh, in it about the creation of, of human beings. But there is one significant difference between those two stories. In the first story, chapter 1, verse 28, to be precise, it says, be, God says to, to, to Adam, the man, 
be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over every living creature. In the second story, God says, to, or it says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Do you hear the difference there? Subdue it and rule over it. Work it and take care of it. Now, those two things, those two ideas aren't mutually exclusive. Subdue and rule could mean the same as work and take care. But it's also quite possible, and indeed we've only got to look back at a few centuries of history to see how it's easy to take that rule over, it, over everything, having subdued it. Uh, you can take that to mean do what you like with it, exploit it, make the most of it. And that sadly has how it has been. Humankind has plundered the earth, treated animals like commodities so that they're at the point of extinction. And lads, I was taking notes during the quiz because I, I put in my notes, you know, the list of endangered species get, gets longer every year. And I can now, with authority, tell you that the list of endangered species is about one million. We have not cared for creation in the way that that second story in Genesis is asking us to do. Do you know, it was only in 1935 which I suppose is a fair while ago now, that someone first coined the phrase or the word ecosystem to describe the interconnectedness of human beings, plants, animals, the environment, the whole planet. We're part of an ecosystem, so what we do affects the whole system as we are starting to find out. The last year or so on the television news, what have we seen? Months, months and months of droughts in some parts of the world leading to wildfires. Storms leading to flooding and destruction. People used to talk about global warming. And I have heard people say, oh, well, that would be nice. We'll have nice mild winters. Yeah. More accurate to talk about climate change and for us that's going to mean yes milder winters but also of course wetter winters as we're finding out how many dry days have we had this year not a lot i think we need to look again at that second genesis story and renew our commitment to care for the earth and all that is in it in the old Methodist hymn book, Hymns and Psalms, there's a, a hymn by a 20th century hymn writer called Fred Pratt Green. The first line of the first verse is interesting. It says, God in his love for us lent us this planet. Lent us this planet. Not gave it to us to do what we want with it. We don't own the planet. We hold it in trust. And with that in mind, we need to think about recommitting ourselves to some practical steps, many of which maybe we're already taking, but maybe we need to think about again and do a bit more. So let's just think in a very mundane way for a moment about practical things that we can do. One is to reduce waste. Well, I was part of the post-war baby boom. I grew up with the mend and make do mentality, as I'm sure a number of you did. You know, we need to do more of that. I get appalled sometimes the way some of my sons buy stuff and jettison it the minute it goes wrong, rather than trying to patch it up and repair it. So reducing waste. Conserving energy is another thing that we need to think about. My dear late wife used to say to me, if I said, shall I turn the heating up a bit? 
used to say, just put another jumper on. Um, conserving energy. Choosing sustainable products. It's encouraging when you go to shops and supermarkets now that you see the fair trade label on stuff or the Rainforest Alliance. Even if you go to buy timber, it will tell you whether it's been sourced from uh, sustainable forests. Be on the lookout for those kind of labels. Avoid plastics wherever possible. I actually get my milk in good old-fashioned glass bottles now. It was interesting when my son and his wife and daughter from France came to stay, Alice, my granddaughter, confronted by a, an unopened glass milk bottle, was trying to sort of pull at the edge of the foil top. But I was glad to see that her dad knew that the old, you know, press down the thumb in the middle and out it pops. Right? She obviously wasn't used to glass milk bottles, but it's something to think about if we're going to care for our planet. And maybe we need to support environmental organisations. The local wildlife trust, I think there are 800 altogether in the country. Friends of the Earth, or even more locally, Plastic Free Frampton. Or the teeth room, and I said that one. I understand that they're looking for a new chairperson in plastic free Frampton, so maybe someone would like to take that up and do a bit of caring for the environment locally. And of course, here's another thing that it's not really the dumb thing to say in church, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's a general election coming up sometime this year. Politicians are being very coy about the date, but it's going to happen. We need to make sure that conservation is on the agenda. So when you get people on your doorstep saying, will you vote for us? That's a question to ask them. What's your position on caring for the environment? So I talked earlier on about the privileges we have and our responsibilities. But it seems to me that caring for the planet is a bit more than just a responsibility. It's a sacred duty. That hymn that I quoted, Fred Pratt Green's hymn, has a, a very good final verse, which is really a prayer. The earth is the Lord's. It is ours to enjoy it. Ours as his stewards to farm and defend from its pollution, misuse, and destruction. Good Lord, deliver us, world without end. Amen. Now, Jane found a very good um, <clears throat> video which plays a, a new hymn. It's one that's found in the new Methodist hymn book. Um, which is called Singing the Faith, isn't it? Um, so if you've got a copy of Singing the Faith at home, you can go and look it up afterwards. Um, we're going to watch the video. It's got some lovely creation kind of uh, scenes in it. If you pick up the tune and know the words, by all means join in. Otherwise, take it as an opportunity for a bit of reflection on our care of the, universe, of the planet around us.
Now let's pray together. God, our creator, your hands forged the world and all the suns and moons and stars of space. You hold everything in being and continue your work moment by moment. And you call us to creativity. that We might share in making and remaking as we place ourselves in your hands. Make us true stewards, caretakers, justice makers, so that what we offer might enrich the life of the world and speak of your glory. God, our liberator, who with a strong hand led the people of Israel out of slavery to freedom, through the hands of Jesus, your son, you healed the sick, releasing them from bondage. And through the piercing of his hands on the cross, you brought the world from death to life. Make us healers too. Healers of one another and healers of the earth. Take our hands into yours, that we may touch all creation with your love. God, our reconciler, who in the person of your spirit beckons us into community, guides us into the paths of peace, and inspires our longing to become more Christ-like. Let your hand nudge us into the adventure of painting new visions, writing new words, building new structures and carving new landmarks to meet the challenges of our time. As you embrace us, may our hands embrace the world to find that all our sisters and brothers, all living things, share the same pulse of God-given life. Lord God, creator, liberator, reconciler, into your hands we commit our lives now. Amen. Final hymn is, uh, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made. During this hymn, if you want to make an offering, the stewards will come round to collect it. A reminder that uh, prayer ministry is available at the end of the service with Peggy and Jean, and coffee and refreshments are served out in the beacon.
Let us pray. Lord, we offer now these gifts of money, given here and given in various other ways. And as we make our gifts, so we commit ourselves afresh to care for the planet in which you've placed us. Give us the strength and the determination to fulfill that pledge. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.